Thank you very much for the invitation to be part of such an interesting conference. Interesting in content, but also in the format. I'm going to look ahead at the impact of the fourth industrial revolution, which I believe will be large and profound. If we think about the future of smart rural communities, we have to think not just what people can see today, but what they will soon realize are the changes ahead. So I'm going to look ahead 16 years. Of course, I can't predict that with any accuracy, but I will give some suggestions as to the kind of changes that people will realize will be happening. New waves of disruption, new technologies, technologies that we already have, but which will become much more significant, and also, very importantly, new human responses to the technology, changes in how humans live and want to live as they realize the possibilities and also the risks and threats from these new technologies. To look ahead 16 years, I'll start by looking back 16 years, comparing the situation today with how it was just a few short years ago. Today, many of the world's politicians communicate on this strange thing called Twitter, which has 330 million active monthly users. 16 years ago, of course, there was no Twitter, and if you told us about it 16 years ago, we could not believe such a thing would happen, probably. Twitter is small in comparison with Facebook, which now has more active users than the largest country in the world. Facebook, I think, might be communicating this meeting live. I keep hearing announcements about starting and stopping meetings. I think at least some of the time we're being broadcast there. But so much else is happening there. And our elections, our referendums are being influenced by what's happening on this strange online Facebook, which did not exist 16 years ago. Today we have Wikipedia, one of the marvels of the modern world with 40 million articles in nearly 300 languages. 16 years ago, there was some Wikipedia, much smaller, and people used to laugh at it. They used to say, look at the errors in this online encyclopedia. Look at the chaos of everybody editing the same articles. It can never be significant how wrong that was, how much valuable, trustworthy information is now there on Wikipedia. Let's consider also how people are accessing this online information via increasingly smartphones. With more than 3 billion people using smartphones today worldwide. 16 years ago, there were some smartphones. I know I was part of the early smartphone industry. There were about 10 million people using smartphones at the end of 2003, many in fact using this wonderful Nokia 6600. Some of you might remember it. It was the world's first multi-million selling smartphone. But today, there are 300 times as many smartphone users. The smartphones are at least 300 times as powerful, have at least 300 times as much storage, and maybe there are about 30,000 times as many applications. How the world has changed. So much so that, according to the last speaker, we need new social norms to stack our smartphones when we go out for meals. And the kinds of things we use on these devices include Google Maps and Google Mail, none of which existed 16 years ago. And now we find them wonderful, but at the same time we realize we realize perhaps dimly that these organizations know an awful lot about us, exactly where we've been, exactly what we're writing. In terms of information about us, we have also medical information. 16 years ago, the cost to do an entire DNA sequencing for one human was $2.7 billion. 
Today, the cost is not billions of dollars. It's not millions of dollars. It's not thousands of dollars. It's $599 from Veritas. And there are other companies offering similar. So information about us is available much more readily, more cheaply. And we have to lastly mention the coverage from CCTVs. I'm not sure about the situation in Iceland, but in London, they are everywhere. And in China, there are 200 million equipped with face recognition and with artificial intelligence, which is understanding more and more about us. Of course, 16 years ago, there were some monitoring cameras, but nothing like so powerful and so intelligent. So can we dare to look ahead another 16 years and imagine the scale of the changes? Some people will say we may have less change than before, but I disagree. I think we're seeing an acceleration. And the cause of acceleration is feedback cycles, positive feedback cycles. The first industrial revolution started when we had steam-powered machinery, which were built with simple tools. But with machinery, we could build better tools, which could build better machinery of all sorts, which could build more kinds of tools of all sorts, including steam locomotives. In the third industrial revolution, we started with quite simple computers. And they were hard to manufacture, and they were hard to design with paper and pencil. But you can use computers in computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing. So one generation of computers can help to design and manufacture a better generation of computers, which can help to design and manufacture even better computers. It's the same with software. Software is written by humans who take advantage of tools such as debuggers and compilers and profilers. And so one generation of software allows software engineers to write better and better generations. And don't laugh, of course, software has bugs and defects. But on the whole, a small team of people can write much larger, much higher quality software than before. All that's the past. That's the third industrial revolution. Looking ahead to the fourth industrial revolution, we're going to see more AI, artificial intelligence, than ever before. Built, of course, by humans, but taking advantage of AI tools to build better AI. AI that analyzes and cleans data, which can then be fed to another AI to do machine learning of deep, big data. AI tools, building better AIs, building better AIs. And then new kinds of computers. The fourth industrial revolution is going to see increasingly quantum computers, which has scope that still few of us can really understand. And surely, once we have some quantum computers, it will help us to design and build and manufacture better quantum computers faster than we expected. The biggest and most important feedback cycle involves people. There are more people on the planet than ever before. Some people dislike that and say more people means more consumption and more waste, but it also means more brains. It also means more innovation, especially when people are educated as never before and when people are networked as never before. It allows more ideas, it allows more creativity, more tools to be created, building more technology. And the better technology, of course, improves the networking. And the better technology improves online education. So we have marvelous TED Talks and Canon Academy, YouTube videos, personalized artificial intelligence teaching us. That's why the world sees more scientists than ever before, all around the world, more engineers building solutions, more entrepreneurs who know the principles of starting companies, applying the startup spirit. More designers who are aware of user-centered principles to help the technology be applied in real-world solutions. More educators to spread the information more widely. Therefore, more artificial intelligence, more deep learning. In summary, that's why I believe we're going to see an acceleration in terms of the impact of technology, 
and an acceleration of disruption. If that's the theory, let's look quickly at the history. The technological change was possible because of an application of the scientific method in an open society which tolerated criticism of the status quo, criticism of authorities, criticism of convention that allowed the first industrial revolution to take place from around the 1760s with steam and then railways which changed the world. Historians talk about the second industrial revolution from about the 1880s. My dates aren't exactly the same as the previous speaker, but broadly the same. Electricity increasingly displaced steam, and we also had new chemicals, oil, and uh, other chemicals that displaced steam. Then we invented new chemicals, synthetic chemicals, and mass production, and automobiles traveling everywhere, changing the world, changing cities, building suburbs. The third industrial revolution had more computers and consumer electronics, and we are now starting early days with the fourth industrial revolution, which we still haven't properly understood because it hasn't fully happened yet, but I describe it, and I'll explain this in a moment, as the NBIC convergence. Before I describe it, I'll just point out there is an acceleration here in timescales. It was about 120 years between the starts of the first two waves. The third wave started about two-thirds as quickly as the previous, and the fourth wave is starting about two-thirds as quickly as the previous. This is another sign of the acceleration of technology. Some of you may be a bit unhappy at this stage, a bit uncomfortable about so much technology, but I have to remind you of the wise words of management guru Peter Drucker, who said, we are becoming aware that the major questions regarding technology are not technical, but human questions. For the successful application of technology, we have to look at lots of human issues, usability, safety, and what people feel when they use the technology. Do they feel good? Do they feel social approval? And questions of cost. So I might modify my previous diagram a bit. Here's the growth of technology enabled by positive feedback cycles, taking advantage of science and the open society, but mediated, transformed by human reactions. What kind of legislation are we putting in place to control some of the worst effects of a careless, disruptive innovation? What kind of skills are we teaching people so they can take advantage and be comfortable of the best aspects of technology? And very importantly, what values are we asserting? What do we want from our technology? And what do we want to want from our technology? And all of these things are changing rapidly too. Our legislation may change slowly, but it is changing. Our skills may change slowly, but it is changing. And our values, I will argue, are changing too. And we have to decide. And we have to anticipate how people's values will change if we really want to plan good things for the rural communities. I said I would explain this fourth industrial revolution, NBIC convergence. This stands for I, information technology. It's the manipulation of bits of data, bits of information, not just to process them, but also to make new algorithms, new intelligence, artificial intelligence from that. N stands for nanotechnology. It's the manipulation not of bits of information, but atoms and molecules. It's molecular manufacturing. It's 3D and 4D printing. It's also building new kinds of machines. Quantum computers, I've mentioned, nanobots as well. It's building new kinds of sensors, very small sensors, cameras everywhere, audio systems everywhere. B stands for biotech. It's editing, not our information in our computers. It's editing and understanding the information in our biology, the genes. It's allowing us to process information and modify our genes with things like CRISPR, 
So we will now see not just synthetic chemicals, we will see synthetic life forms doing more tasks for us. And C stands for Cognotech, understanding our brains as never before, knowing how to improve our brains as never before. The top of this represents hardware, the bottom represents software, the left represents physics in a way, the right represents biology, which is why there's four quadrants. But most importantly, there are connections between these different revolutions. The better nanotech we have, the more sensors we have. So we can sense, for example, what's happening inside somebody's brain without cutting their head open. We can understand what's going on in people's brains when they're being intuitive or meditating or being creative. And we can copy the same design principles from the human brain into our artificial intelligence, into our infotech and build better artificial intelligence, which then will allow us to build better biotech and so forth. To look inside these boxes, here are the 20 ways in which I believe the world will be significantly transformed in the next 16 or years or so. Molecular manufacturing, 3D printing, I don't have time to go through all of this. Biotech, we're already seeing some genetic editing and stem cell therapies, later lab-grown meat, possibly enhancing our pets, possibly even abolishing aging. Information technology, artificial creativity, wearable computing, effective computing. And Cognotech is perhaps the least developed of these four revolutions, but with the biggest potential as we find ways to improve our consciousness and improve our emotions via not just traditional methods like, consciousness, like meditation and going into nature, but augmenting them wisely, if we are smart, with good technology. There's more, of course. There are new technologies that are changing the world, arising from combinations of the previous technologies, driverless cars, geoengineering, drone swarms. But as I said earlier, the most important thing here is the human element. And the most important technologies, the ones which will determine whether these other technologies lead to a better world or a worse world, whether they lead to better smart rural communities or worse rural communities, will be how we operate the technologies of social tech. Things like how do we apply the financial resources wisely? How do we store the data on clouds in ways that's accessible to everybody? How do we ensure that it's free from tampering with things like the blockchain and distributed ledgers? How do we modify the mechanisms of the markets to avoid market failures and financial crashes? And instead, do we have markets working well? Well, how do we operate the regulations in a way that keep up with the requirements of changing technology instead of lagging behind and regulating yesterday's problems instead of tomorrow's opportunities? How do we ensure that our private things remain private, that our systems remain secure? All of these technologies are perhaps even more techno important than the ones in NBIC. And I've left the last two most important technologies Till now. The technologies for better politics, so that the best ideas rise to the surface instead of the loudest ideas or the ideas of the people with the richest pockets. And the technologies for truly better education, so that we can very quickly bring people up to be full citizens of this rapidly changing world. I'll end with a couple of thoughts about the implications for smart rural communities. As I've said, we have to anticipate not just technology changes, but changes in what humans want and value and prioritize. One we thing we can already see, more and more people are, un are unhappy with some of the side effects of industrial capitalism, worried about the destruction of nature, especially due to the emission of greenhouse gases. And so we can anticipate fairly easily the growing importance of green technology even more than we've seen already. I mention this as a lead-in to another kind of adverse reaction to capitalism, a different kind of reaction, reaction to the surveillance and manipulation which people increasingly realize is happening. So we will be concerned not just about the destruction of nature, but the alteration in a bad way of human nature 
concern about the destruction of our freedom to make informed choices because increasingly we know we are being tracked by Google Maps and Google Mail and Facebook likes. We are being tracked by all kinds of cameras which are influencing our democracy not in a good way. And as people realize this, there is more of a tech clash, a backlash against technology and an insistence that these systems be transparent and accountable and an insistence that these companies which are doing wonderful things but are also doing terrible things that they are brought under democratic control. This backlash, this tech clash is going to grow and we should be smart and get ahead of that trend. There are implications in terms of the technologies to build vibrant rural communities. I'm sure the other speakers are going to say more about this that people feel connected even though they are remote via what we're doing today, this video communications, but more immersive as we put on our headsets and as we feel sensory tactile feedback through costumes or gloves that we might put on that give us more of a feeling of connecting even though we are remote. That this system must be secure because in the future, sadly, there's going to be more crime from online hacking. It's very profitable for people who are interested in crime to do your crime online. We have to be even more secure than before. And then there's a the question of bringing down the cost of high quality facilities and accommodation around the country with the technologies that can decrease the costs like 3D printing, modular construction, drone surveillance to find faults early, nanotech, for better recycling rather than waste. But the most important thing that will make people want to stay in the local communities and enjoy staying in the local communities is a powerful sense that there is a positive future there. The future is not just in the big cities, but it is local too. So this vision, I think, is increasingly important that humans can flourish fully everywhere with no one left behind that the fruits of the abundance of these wonderful technologies can be shared with everybody, not just those who happen to be in the big cities, those indeed who have work. Because my answer to the question, whose jobs are going to be taken by the robots, is probably almost everybody. And we have to find the ways then to share the fruits of the robots' work with everybody. And so the most important issue is not just how do we retrain people to work, but how do we alter this contract of society so that everybody is looked after in some way, perhaps by a universal basic income, more likely by making the cost of living lower and lower. So that's my thoughts about the implications for smart rural communities. My advice is don't underestimate the pace of change. Be ready for more change than you had in mind and be ready to think about the human dimension even more than the technological dimension. Thank you very much.